started our organization only five years old. We have helped rural communities raise over $29 million. $29 million to help help support their technology uh, ecosystem. Just recently, the EDA made an announcement that six of the communities that we work with in rural America received $12.5 million. Now, you want to know how did we help them get that money? Here's the journey. This is where I come in at in the Southeast. One, I'm working with leadership to convene influencers, economic developers, uh, education leaders, deans, presidents of universities, as well as those community leaders, boots on the ground who are driving change every single day. And we all have seen those individuals kind of just pop up from out of nowhere, but making tremendous strides in our community over the past couple of years. And so my role is to work and team up, you know, break down some silos that may exist in these communities. Then from there, we do assessment work. So we assess communities, but not all communities, especially in the South Park life. So we do assessment work, so we do assessment. Uh, we, when we survey uh, the community, also we are doing um, are doing interviews with stakeholders, just to kind of get an idea of what are some of the challenges that's out there, what some of the opportunities or assets that exist. And what I've learned in economic development, a lot of times because you know, where you live, you sometimes don't realize that you're, you're sitting on a gold line, so to speak, as well, too. And so that's when we work with the communities on that. So from assessment, the next phase is strategizing. So in that assessment, we get recommendations on how to build a tech ecosystem that's inclusive and sustainable. And so we, we give you some ways to execute and be successful. Then the final piece uh, of this is grant writing support. So we have the capacity within our organization to help communities with providing guidance for helping them to write their grant proposals. And so then from there, that's how they have opportunities to receive some of that federal funding, but also we do work with them also philanthropic funding as well too. Then the final step is communities have an opportunity to draw what we call the Rural Innovation Network. I'll tell you a little bit about the Rural Innovation Network. It consists of 33 communities. These 33 communities across the, the United States, as you see here, including Wilson, North Carolina, and also Pine, North Arkansas, Chambers uh, County, Alabama. It's it's a it's a community of practice where where if you're here in Cleveland, Mississippi, you're able to connect with someone in Marquette, Michigan, you know, in, or Eastern Kentucky and talk about and learn what are some of the best practices, how do you build your ecosystem? What are some programs that you all have implemented that we can do here at home? And so it's, a, it's mentors uh, that you're being connected with. Also, you're also being connected with, with um, subject matter ex uh, experts from our own organization uh, that specialize in specific drivers for, such as uh, inclusive tech culture building. Uh, tech job creation, uh, as well as access to capital. Uh, Corey also has uh, a seed fund called Corey Innovation Fund that helps provide um, seed capital, early stage capital for uh, rural uh, tech startups. And so that's something that we continue to increase and build on that as well as we provide, we also have some pitch competitions as well too. And I would remiss not to mention that we do have one coming up on November the 10th that you all can pay attention and watch online for free. And so expanding our work across the Southeast, as I mentioned, let me go back to this, this slide here. What's missing? Mississippi. I joined an organization back in May. I moved here, moved back to the South from, from Michigan. The sole purpose and mission to create a tech ecosystem across the Southeast, especially in places that I'm very much familiar with, that have challenges, but I always see them as places with brand opportunities. So I'm wondering, I've been traveling around the city going to events like the speaking, I'm just wondering who's going to be that community in Mississippi for the first one 
to become a part of our Royal Innovation Network, go through our re uh, program, and then get some of their funding that we can help communities get. Now, here's the thing. We can't do this work for you. We cannot. But what we're doing here at Corey is that we are empowering communities to do this work. What we look for in community, we are prioritizing micropolitics. Micropolitan areas with populations of 5,000, under 50,000. We work specifically in rural America. Another very important piece is that we've seen this work very well in communities that have excited leadership. This can only go as far as your leadership allows it to go. I can want this for Cleveland, I can want this for every county in, in the state of Mississippi. But the people have to want it. The leadership has to want it. It's very important. Then also, higher ed institutions within 30 minutes, we've seen communities be very successful by having an anchor institution. Um, one, they provide a pipeline of talent. You, you have Delta State University here that's attracting talent across this country. So what if we have a strong tech ecosystem that's keeping the talent in the region because there's opportunities here that exist? And higher ed institutions are great resources, as well as they have some programs uh, to have upskill and reskill um, your community or your residents here. Then also, most importantly, is adequate uh, broadband. Because you have a lot of tech opportunities as far as employment goes, where you're working remote. I, too, work remote. So it's important that I have adequate broadband. Other thing I just mentioned, tech talent, diversity. Diversity is part of my mission, is a part of my strategy. I wouldn't be here if diversity was not included in the midst of my work. And communities such as this, that have not necessarily, don't, do not have a majority or a community that has a, a larger BIPOC population is where I'm focusing my attention on, especially uh, in the Delta region. Also want to give you an example of how we are impacting communities through our broadband work. I'd like to give you just some information. Um, we did a project uh, in partnership with the Ayers Foundation. The Ayers Foundation um, they tapped us because they knew of our work in rural America. They knew how we have been um, uh, impacting communities. And so they wanted us to work, work and start off with a handful of counties in rural Tennessee. Um, they wanted us to do some assessment work because what happened, as you all remember, 2020, and so you had a student who now had to do their work online. But it was an adequate broadband. They didn't have internet, as some of our our subject matter experts mentioned earlier today. And so we worked in these communities, did some assessment work, giving them pathways um, on how to build a stronger broadband through fiber to the home, which that's our focus because of the sustainability, um, the scalability of fiber to the home, and as well as maintenance over time is going to be a lot cheaper than satellite, cable, DSL. So we focus on the fiber to the home. And so we started out with five communities, five counties, and they loved the way the work was going. They ended up getting some additional funding to help support us expanding into multiple counties. So we ended up in 13 counties. Uh, and they were in uh, Western Tennessee, parts of Middle Tennessee, and also uh, some parts of Eastern Tennessee. We helped these communities uh, receive $80 million in federal funding to construct their fiber to the home so that underserved, especially those, those individuals in, in BIPOC communities, can have access to better internet service. So $80 million plus an additional $30 million um, for, to match those federal funds. And here's the thing about what I've learned about working in the South is that, as I mentioned earlier, not all communities are, are the same. Some communities, it may take a little bit more time, it may, it may take us to be a little bit more flexible. And so through our partnership with such organizations, philanthropic organizations, such as the Walking Family uh, Foundation, 
we're able to work in um, the Delta to help communities, um, specifically in Jefferson County in Arkansas, Phillips County in Arkansas, um, as well as Mahoma County um, in Mississippi to help them, you know, one, meet them where they are in assessing their community, assessing the tech ecosystem, and working with them to get them to a point where they have their tech ecosystem. So let me go back to this map before I end. So I'm from Arkansas, and my family from a place called Dumas, Arkansas, southeast, right outside of Palm Bluff. I remember when they built a community center, and it was a big thing. It's like, oh, we built this community center, they cut a ribbon. So here's my vision. What if tech hubs replaced community centers across the rural southeast, where you have young people going there to get trained on coding, using the internet. You have entrepreneurs who have co-working spaces. At the top, they're living in that hub as well too. And you're creating a community that starts at that hub. Now you see things happening in that city, becoming more vibrant. Young people are now staying in that community because they can work and they can play, they can do things in those communities. That's my vision. I believe it can happen, but it's going to take time. But I want to just leave you all with that. We're doing a lot of incredible work, and so my ask for you is do you have leaders out there who's interested in building a tech ecosystem and impacting generational wealth? in their community and creating tech job employment opportunities for their residents. If you know who they are, look for economic developers, higher ed leaders, as well as community leaders who are interested in being a part of some uh, future cohorts. Please do reach out to me. I have a, uh, a, a, a one pager in front of me for my information. More information, you can get along more information about board. Um, and you can contact me as well, too. With that being said, thank you uh, to the Community Foundation of Northwest Mississippi uh, for having me. And I know a lot of great work that you all do because I know of the one in Arkansas that done a lot of great work as well, too. Thank you very much. Before we bring our next presenter, we just have a little housekeeping. Um, uh, comment before you leave, please stop by the desk and turn in your lanyard. Thank you. Um, next to present our uh, next two presenters is Jillian Morrison. She'll be introducing uh, Otis Jones, our Quitman County Administrator, and Dr. Ann Kafer, who is our Quitman County Strategic Planner. Um, and they will be facilitating the conference uh, forum, and one will be joining virtually. So, what a great way to introduce technology. <laughs> and I'll introduce uh, uh, Senator Sarita Simmons, who's walked in the room. Would you please stand? Thank you, Sarita, for joining us today. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Salvador Maria Grace, Serio Producia Trust, C Spire, Delta State University. West End District, Center for Population Studies, Delta Directions, and the Maddox Foundation. And I'd also like to introduce and thank our federal partners for being here, Mr. Ty James and Mrs. Cheeks. Would you please raise your hand and thank y'all so much for being here today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to welcome Otis Jones, the County Administrator, up to the stage. And we have Dr. Annie Kaver from the Center for Population Studies at the University of Mississippi joining us on Zoom. So exciting technology. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself first briefly, and then Otis, if you will introduce yourself, and then we'll have Dr. Kaver introduce yourself as well. So my name is Jillian Morrison. I am the Delta Legal Fellow housed at the Center for Population Studies at the University of Mississippi. Um, I always joke I never really thought much about broadband until I was in law school during COVID. 
and I'd never used Zoom before. And then suddenly we're in the middle of a Zoom class and you hear, okay, this is going to be on the test, and then your screen buffers and everything shuts down. <laughs> and comes back about five minutes later. And that's a special level of terror. And that's even in a pretty urban place where we're supposed to have good internet. So I'm really excited to get to participate in the work that the county is doing around broadband and strategic planning, and that Annie is doing as well. Um, so Mr. Jones, if you would mind introducing yourself. Good morning. My name is Joseph Jones. I'm an equipment county administrator. Are there other administrators in the, in the, in the room? Stuck me something. I see. So, uh, I was born, I was raised on a small rural, rural farm in uh, Putney County. And I was graduate old then, uh, in Indian school. I got a uh, computer science degree. So I think one of the other speakers spoke about that we don't have to have an engineering degree, uh, computer science degree. You kind of touched the nerve a little bit, right? <laughs> I was at a meeting at, what is it, the Cody Academy? In Watertown. Right. And the director said, any of these students can, can outcode any old Miss computer science graduate. I kept smiling. I was first. I didn't really know. <laughs> I got to think about the time when I used to walk across campus across the road at 2 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, Sunday morning, 2 o'clock from the engineering building. And she's telling me that this is a kid that I told me. <laughs> so, anyway, so we'll be to continue on with what we're. Let's have uh, Dr. Paper. Can you hear us? Yeah, there we have. Perfect. We can hear you too. Would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, apologies for not being able to be in person. I'm trying to be in three places at once today, so thank you, technology. Um, I'm a faculty member here at the University of Mississippi and currently serving as director for the Center for Population Studies, which houses the State Data Center. I also co direct a community based research center here on campus called You Improve that does a lot of capacity building with communities. Um, I'm a rural sociologist by training and do a lot around community-based participatory research and resilience building. Now, if, if I just yell, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, no, no, yeah. no, we're feeling okay. Then I'll take this back. This is fun. It's like we're a... Yeah, hold it close. Have... Hold it close. Okay. Good. Perfect. Um, you're going to regret giving me a microphone. So... I think where we'll begin, um, Otis, you have done a lot of work in Quitman County to build awareness around broadband, um, through doing a variety of things, including surveying, holding meetings. Would you mind talking to us about the process of building broadband awareness in Quitman County? And feel free to talk about Quitman County too, please. Look, I'd like to uh, start off by kind of thinking back on what Keith was saying about when he was, when he was great and so forth, right? So, my family, we have a Zoom meeting. Uh, family Zoom meeting probably about two or three times a year. And one of my older sisters said that she was telling a story about how the sheriff came out on our farm looking for coins, like white light, right? And one of my nephews and my niece said, So my grandfather was a bootlegger? I was highly offended. I said, No. My father was a bunch of a no. He was the first wholesale distributor of spirits. <laughs> so let's talk about information for, for a quick thing. So who you knows who's Charles Babbage? Who's Charles Babbage? No one knows who Charles Babbage is? IT people? This is your field. <laughs> that was meant for his great great great. So he 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 was the he told me the of the first electronic device, right? So information is powerful. I was probably about ten years old when my brother from Chicago set up a set of encyclopedias. Right at school, I would you know go start with encyclopedias, but. Once those encyclopedias get the household, man, I just live with those encyclopedias all the time, just studying, studying, studying. I think I have a PhD by the time I started uh, middle high school. But I came across this Charles Babbage character, right? And I started studying and studying and studying and studying, and that led me to 
actually major of the human side. So that little bit of information, well, information is very powerful, no matter how it comes to you these days, it can come to you even faster than raw faster than you know bones to the cell inside the kidney as well. Just to show information is still positive. Right? So when I when I think of the word we here, I'm, I'm talking about parties in the county. Such as we just had people like the economic development director, Ms. Del Wilson, Stan, Senator Jackson, and Sam McCray. And of course, the whole big team, right? So that's the uh, course we're putting down to the back, right? So they are helping to push the awareness in the county of our problem. The one thing I learned uh, when I returned to home is that I spent what the majority of my life in Nashville a little bit. Is that in a rural area, the norm, right? You have a tendency to accept a lower norm, right? Because people tell you, well, you're in a rural or rural county, right? That means nothing to them, right? What we what we've been trying to do is to introduce them to the fact that there's a better norm, so to speak, right? Slow internet, expensive internet. Maybe that's become a norm. So we wanted to push that awareness beyond that. So uh, but one way one way we got that is through surveying. Uh, we put we out surveys to the school, middle school, high school, churches, businesses, and so forth. And that information came back to <coughs> their, their organization to kind of collect data and so forth, right? I know Sally and Commissioner alluded to the fact that in a roundabout way that we need to do our homework. Sally loves her, right? We just can't wait on Sally, right? There may be some holes still when it's all said and done that we can say, oh, wait a minute. We, 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 we haven't plugged this over here yet, right? So that's the type of homework that uh, I, I, you know, I would encourage each county uh, to try to pursue so forth, right? Uh, and Dr. Kaper, would you mind talking about how broadband fits into the larger strategic planning process or what the strategic planning process is in the County? Wait, you might be muted. Yeah, no, I know. You would think three years into this, like that wouldn't be something that happens regularly, but it does. Um, so I can talk about the broader strategic planning process. So I want to thank um, Dom and I spoke for bringing us in to help facilitate that. This is what we do, we facilitate. Um, and they had a vision for wanting to be at the forefront prepared as um, infrastructure dollars begin to roll down, as they begin to plan for their vision of what the county could be. Um, and, and our process is really sort of a consensus building model. So we come in, we work with the community, we make sure that there is a diverse set of stakeholders at the table, and we begin to identify those strategic priorities for the community. And that can be lots of things, um, if I'm recalling, Equipment, um, there were five. It was really housing, broadband, water, sewer, roads. And there's a fifth one I can't remember. Sorry, Velma. Um, and then we sort of narrowed it down to what are the digestible pieces? What are things that we could tackle and really develop a comprehensive three to five year strategic plan with the community to execute on? Um, and then over a series of months, we work with the community to do fact finding. So we do asset mapping. We look at what the secondary data is. We look at the grants and the funding infrastructures available to fund some of that work. Um, we take inventory of what's already currently taking place and the assets that are available in the community to leverage towards strategic planning. And then we figure out where the community might need a little bit more support and start brokering some of those partnerships um, or supporting sort of budding partnerships that might exist. And I think broadband is a really good example of that in, in thinking through the partnerships with um, Commissioner Presley and thinking through partnerships with Aristotle and 
um, Tallahassee Valley. So I think there that that's our process. Is we know that it is a combination of public funding, local funding, local manpower, and the private sector, and figuring out how to weave those together is part of what we do. Um, and we try to take the burden off of the community in terms of collecting that data, verifying some of that data, and then really drafting up a plan that then they can look at and through a series of town hall, we'll make sure that we've included everything that they wanted. Um, and we do this in a way that is um, approachable to community, so that it's not this really shocking sticker price that, that the document has to strategic planning for communities. Um, as a rural sociologist, we also make sure that we're um, cognizant of some of the, the things that are very nuanced and specific to rural spaces. Um, I think I think that's it, right? Jillian's also like a strategic planning group, so she, yeah, she's very fucking. Right, so she also, of course, uh, and yeah, where you should mention that we had the town hall meeting and so forth, right? That was a great avenue to educate the public. And I would just like to say that it's not wrong that the town administrator, I get all kinds of concerns, complaints, you want to put them in that level, right? But since we started our push to educate the public, now we're complex about the internet. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Like, I was at the place. I was all of them. Someone called me the morning back and said, What? what? Uh, you tell me. Right? So, <laughs> so that's kind of how, I, uh, how, how we're going to use that. I, and in my, in my area, uh, remote, uh, I believe Mr. Campbell makes about a job, a remote job. I've been working remote since, I guess, way before COVID, a lot of people started working remote and so forth. I guess the IT world uh, invented that concept and so forth. But even now, I, I do consulting work uh, in my spare time and uh, the weekends and so forth right, for companies uh, back in Nashville, and I do that remotely. So we're hoping that the broadband will have spawned uh, some entrepreneurs, uh, companies, you know, in the uh, in Now, I promised the prize questions. So now I'm going to ask you some prize questions that I thought about. So, okay, what has been one of the biggest challenges around building awareness or understanding around broadband in your community? Right, so I kind of alluded to, to this earlier, right? Is that I think some people buy into that this rural poor county mentality, you know, not, not to be made in right and so forth, right? So, like I said, a goal. Right, sometimes to get people to think, uh, I mean, differently. I mean, like my sister, for example, I remember the mouse, and they used to tell you the mouse, she had a big problem with that sort of thing. <laughs> the way of thinking, right? So you got, you got to change the way of thinking and, and let them know that there is a better norm, so to speak, right? There's something much better. And to try to move them from a comfort, a comfort zone that they're, that they're in now to, uh, to, to the next level. Just because you live in a little space doesn't mean you should have to have no internet, slow internet, internet that costs one hundred and thirty dollars that you can't afford. All of that. Excellent. And Dr. Paper, would you like to answer the same question? What do you think is one of the bigger challenges around strategic planning? Can you say that a little close to the computer because I want to answer yes. the wrong question? What is one of the biggest challenges around strategic planning in communities? If communities are thinking about doing that. So I think some of the biggest challenges that we encounter in communities that we work with is um, first is always engaging really that diverse stakeholder group. Um, there's always going to be a group or groups that feel disenfranchised and don't feel invested in the process. And those are the folks that you need at the table most. They need to understand that this process is for them and includes them. Um, and that's how we build equitable I think the other challenges um, can, can sometimes be the, the thought of funding strategic planning. It does not have to be expensive, um, but it does require folks to come to the table and be willing to work. 
But I find that to be something that the community we've worked with thus far, they come to the table and they've done the hard work. Um, I also think that in rural spaces, it sometimes is a little slower at the start because you're, you're trying to build that critical mass of enthusiasm, excitement, and because our, our counties are so geographically dispersed in terms of population, getting folks to the table is just physically harder sometimes. And so, and so being able to account for that and being patient with that process when it's all said and done, the strategic planning process in Putnam County will have taken a year. Um, but it will be comprehensive and it will have multiple stakeholder input. The other thing is sometimes um, dealing with historical tension or things that as outsiders we may not be aware of that undercurrent. And I think that's where folks just need to be super transparent with us. Um, and helping us think through how to navigate that carefully and respectfully, um, but in a way that moves the conversation forward. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I think we are running up on time, and lunch may be here. Yes. Um, so any closing thoughts, Otis, or Anne? I'll let Otis go first. Okay. So I'm just going to keep pushing. Just uh, pushing on to try to make things that I uh, I returned to Mississippi to try to to help the community. People ask me, so, "Well, you had a great career and so forth, right?" But I said it's, it's incomplete. It's not quite complete yet until I totally give back. So that's why I'm here. And I would say, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. The strategic planning we've done so far has been at a county level, but we've also worked with some nonprofits. We've also worked with smaller community groups. Um, you know, we're a public-facing entity with a statewide mission, and so if you have data needs, if you're doing your own strategic planning, and you just need support in terms of accessing secondary public data, we're happy to help with that. If you need more facilitation, we're also happy to help and have that have that conversation of how um, you did that support. <coughs> oh, thank you. Um, and I just want to say thank you both for being here to speak. And also a huge thank you to the stakeholders of Putman County because without all of them, without the mayor, the board of supervisors, without the council for small farmers, um, everybody who's come to the table, this process wouldn't be something we could do. So we're very excited about it. And now I'm going to pass it back in advance of lunchtime. Well, thank you to all of our presenters. I hope that we have found this uh, forum very informative. Um, I welcome you all to please enjoy your lunch. And then during lunch, we're going to hear from Jillian Morrison, who will be talking about the Affordable Connectivity Program. Enjoy your lunch.